Aren't you new since the dance? I know, but. All right, it looks like it's 5.30, so we'll go ahead and call this meeting order. We'll begin with the uh, invocation. Uh, Andrew, would you be so kind? Sure. So I would like to ask for your uh, guidance and wisdom and how to be able to help better our city tonight. We ask that you will lay healing hands across our community and across our country in these times that we are experiencing. In your name, amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Here. Back in Stos. Here. Peterson. Here. Lucas. Here. Lee. Here. Harmon. Here. Reeker. Here. Ostendorf. Here. All right. Um, I'd like to go over the meeting proceed. First of all, thank everyone for being here. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I realize that we have a public hearing tonight, so I'm assuming that some of the folks that are here would like to speak, and I would make sure that you will make sure that you have that opportunity. Uh, but I'd like to go over the meeting procedures. Um, the public may address a specific item or agenda items at the pleasure of the mayor. If recognized by the mayor, please state your name and address and limit remarks to three minutes or less. Out of respect to city employees, we request that any complaints or criticisms of employees not be aired in a public meeting. Concerns about employees should be brought to the attention of the city administrator or the mayor, and an, an individual in violation will be declared out of order. Uh, for our council member, persons around this table, if, if I may, uh, when, when you speak, make sure you get close enough to, the, to your microphone, make sure your microphone's on. And if you can hear yourself on that speaker back there, you're probably talking loud enough. If not, you're probably not. I learned a valuable lesson the other night trying to hear people around this table on Zoom, and I couldn't hear anybody unless they were right up, up to this microphone. So if you'd be so kind to those folks that are listening in elsewhere, we want to make sure that they're able to hear what everybody has to say. So uh, with that in mind, oh, well, currently, I better tell you this, though. A current copy of the Open Meetings Act in Nebraska is posted on the walls of the council chambers and in the conference room. All right, we'll begin with the consent agenda. Item number one is approved minutes of May 19th, 2020. Item number two, place on file ML and W reports for April 2020. Item number three, place on file treasurer's report for April 2020. Item number four, mayor's reappointment of Lisa Burke to the Cody Scout Commission. And item number five is a DOP recommendation by the North Platte Planning Commission for a preliminary final approval of Smith Smith Third Replat located at 109 West Phillip Avenue in a B2 Highway commercial district. Who do we approve by one through five of the consent agenda? Second. Roll call. Yes, please. Aye. Back in Stowe's. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Lucas. Aye. Lee. Aye. Carmen. Aye. Reeker. Aye. Ostendorf. Aye. Motion carried eight to zero. Thank you, Don. Regular agenda action required. Uh, item number six. 
a public hearing and act on a resolution to approve and adopt a blight and substandard study by the city of North Platte and approve a related actions regarding North Platte, Nebraska blight and substandard study. And this is a public hearing if anyone wishes to speak. Judy? Judy Clark, Development Department. Um, just wanted to make sure that you received all of the information, staff summary report, a copy of the Blight and Substandard Study, and a copy of the resolution. Just a little bit of background. This did go to Planning Commission at the last um, Planning Commission meeting, which was May 26th, I believe, at 530. We did have several people in the audience to speak about it. And just wanted to let you know that um, we do have the developer in the audience and also the consultant who wrote the um, blight and substandard study. So if you have any questions, and I'm here too if you have any questions for me. Thank you. Um, okay. not, Jim did, okay. Anybody else wishes, here we go. If you would be so kind as to state your name and your address, please. My name is Carolyn Henry, and I live at 4001 Sugarberry Road. And I think you all received the letter that, and I have a, the signatures of the people here. So do you want me to read it or do you mind? I don't believe you need to read it. We all have copies. Okay. Okay. Um, I just have a couple questions. Uh, how many homes on Sugarberry did the Planning Commission use for making the decision to make our homes blighted and substandard? I have heard one. Is that right? Uh, was Judy in here? Where did she run off to? I'm not sure I can answer that or anyone around this table. Judy might be able to help us out. What was the question? How many homes? On Sugarberry, did they did the planning commission uh, make use for making the decision to uh, make our homes divided and substandard? Okay, the planning commission used this study, so they didn't pick out individual homes. These are the homes that are on in that area. I know, I live there. Okay, and the reason for blight and substandard study, we don't particularly oh, like. Excuse me, Judy. This is a little awkward, but ma'am, if you would just step over and let Judy get next to that microphone. Oh, here. Sorry. <laughs> not I know this. Up. This is so tough, but okay. So. Just, just to make it clear, and it's you know, it's maybe better if we get um, Keith Marvin in here, but just to make it clear, Planning Commission did not declare any of this blight and substandard. Mm -hmm. They approved the study in the fact that. The study met current standards based on Nebraska state statutes. However, there were some homes in there. The blight and substandard is based off of the age. There is no way, shape, or form that planning commission or even the consultant went through and thought that any of these homes were deteriorating. The criteria that they used with the homes was the age of the homes. A lot of the homes were built in 73, 74. Um, that makes them 40 years old, so that is some of the criteria. We just don't want people to get the wrong idea that we're looking at these homes and saying they're in bad shape. They're old homes. Does that answer your question? Well, my home was built, I believe, in 1979. Okay. So, is that so there, were a few, there were a few homes in this study area. You can see by the blue here, and this is on page 12, if any of you would like to know. There are a few homes that are less than the 40 year old criteria. The rest of them meet the 40 year old criteria. That's based off of the assessor's data. So unless the assessor is incorrect, but that is based off the assessor's data. Okay. We've never seen that in the paper or anything, you know, that designates which ones are right. older. Yep. Okay. Uh, I, uh, and a, su a suggestion I have, would you put the map back? Okay, what about this little house clear up here in the northwest corner? It's not included in this, but that's closer to all this area than we are. 
why wouldn't that be included as blighted and substandard? Okay, she's it's talking, old enough. She's talking about the area that's up in the northwest corner. Um, I believe that is outside city limits, but let me have the um, person who authored the study answer that question, why he did not choose to put that in there. Okay. I do believe it's because it's outside city limits, but okay. Let me move so he can come in. No, we're, we're okay. If he can come in. And again, Carolyn, this is a little bit awkward, but I'm going to have to ask you to move over just a little bit. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, I want to tell you, this is the first public meeting I've been to in two months, so it's nice to be seen. Uh, the reason is, if we're talking about the area just immediately south of West A, down to, uh, are we talking about? No, uh, this is the house I'm talking oh, about. That is not in the city limits. If, in order to blight and declare something blight and suspended by state law, it has to be in the city limits. Okay. So it's not in the city limits at this point in time. I did look at that. Okay. So. Did you get a copy of our letter? No, I did not. Okay. There is a copy of our letter if you would like to read that. And then I have signatures of all the people we went around the neighborhood and got signatures. Okay. So. Okay. I plan to be back to answer other questions. Okay. Uh, just another suggestion I thought of. Maybe we ought to change. Microphone, please. Oh. <laughs> another suggestion I had is maybe we should change the law to 50 years instead of 40 years. We would have to contact your senator to change that law. Okay. We have nothing to do with that, but thank you. Okay. I don't disagree. All right. Thank you for listening. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh -huh. Good evening. Um, I'm Lisa Gerard, and I live at 3907 Sugarberry Road. And um, I'm here with my husband, Ronald Gerard. Um, we're very concerned about this study about um, determining whether or not our neighborhood is blighted. Uh, we're very concerned about TIF money being abused and misused. Um, if, if you'll bear with me while I um, just tell you that you know, the, the legal term for blighted means that land that is dilapidated, unsafe, and unsightly condition, our neighborhood could be no further from that. Um, the whole reason we moved to that neighborhood just less than four years ago was because it's one of the most desirable neighborhoods in our community. The homes are not dilapidated. Um, at any time of the year, you can drive up and down our street and see people constantly improving on our homes. And they may meet the 40-year-old criteria, but that's the only criteria that these homes meet, no other criteria. Um, as far as the TIF money, it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that the TIF money is to be used to bring new business into town, not for new homes. That is one of, the, one of the reasons, but it can also include housing. Okay, so we have so many people right now being laid off from the railroad. So many people right now even being laid off from all kinds of stores right now. Um, some be because of the railroad. And that's not gonna get better just because um, the COVID-19 crisis. Ends, okay, that the railroad is still going to continue to lay off workers, that they've promised that. And so to continue to build homes, when we have over 200 homes, close to 250 homes actually, on the market right now, that's insane to funnel TIF money into a business that is already established instead of creating new business for our community. And I, I just kind of see this as an established business person 
illegally funneling money into their business. So I appreciate your time tonight um, and I appreciate your thoughtful consideration on this project. I do hope that you will vote no on this. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Wow, this is cumbersome. Hi. I hope this doesn't last forever. <laughs> Um, this is the first proposal I have had the privilege of looking at and kind of going through it, but I just found some things that I didn't understand. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Donna Tryon, 820 you. South Tryon, I'm sorry. Thank you. And if you'd be so kind, uh, speak into that microphone. Yeah, my voice isn't very strong anyway, so. Okay, so this is the first uh, proposal I've had the chance to spend any time looking at. And I did uh, go on the assessor's website and I also did talk to the assessor's office about the, the dates that were as home built on their website. So most, not all, but uh, I think it was 12 or 13 homes in this um, area were built in 1979. So at the end of 2019, you could probably assume they were 40 years old, but we really don't know, they couldn't tell me when during those years that the homes were started and when they were completed. So given the benefit of the doubt, I just did a little spreadsheet. And if they, um, uh, like if a home was built in 1979, it'd be 40 years old in 2019. Well, we're into May, June now of 2020. So it, it, that home may not even be yet 40 years old. So I could not get the average to come up to 40 years, um, 38 and a half, 39 and a half. So I, the statute says at least 40. So that was one issue I had. And the other one was just, a, I don't know what it is. It's on page 73. It has the total residential area 47.3. But if you take and add the single families at 45.4, and there's one multi-dwelling is 0.1. That doesn't add up to 47.3. It adds up to 45.5. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's probably very minor, but I just, I didn't understand that part of it. The other thing that I noticed that um, this um, proposal was talking about 24 homes, but in every map that could find it has, there's 25 lots in there. So I don't know what home they're not counting or why there's 24 in the proposal, but in the map you count them, there's 25 lots. So thank you for listening. You. Anyway, please vote no, they're, they're not. As the intent of the law, they don't qualify, I don't think. And there's probably a lot of other homes in other parts of the town and lots that that this law would apply to. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Rob Jonas, 402 Sugarberry Road. I guess I want to state my feelings on this here definition of blighted also. And I'm reading this and I read part A where it's got all these things listed that the term is blighted. And to say that there's a cracked sidewalk on Sugarberry Road or a bad curb is ridiculous. If you follow this paragraph A, they're supposed to meet those qualifications before it ever gets down to paragraph B where it says 40 year homes. These other ones have to be met first. And as far as the 40 year homes, I heard somebody say about well, 39.5 is close enough. That isn't what it says. It says 40 years old, not close enough. So I feel that uh, 
And, and I'll, I'll first of all I'll express, I have nothing against TIF. I think it's a good program if it's used correctly. And I also want to say that I appreciate the city council. I think you got a tough job here. You got a lot of decisions to make, but I hope that you uh, consider this real closely because Sugarberry Road is not a blighted area. And I don't think you can use a, a little cracked sidewalk or something to qualify as TIF. If anybody drives down that street, there's homes under a lot of people dream to have. It's a, it's a nice neighborhood, it's a nice street, and I just don't feel this piece of qualifications. And then there's another question I would like that uh, across the street there's 40 some homes built on 20 acres, and that land wasn't called blighted. So all of a sudden, why is this same ground called blighted over there? It doesn't make any sense. So anyway, I want to thank you for listening, for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walt. Appreciate your time. My name's Ronald Eric Gerard. I live at 3907 Sugarberry Road. Um, my wife, Lisa R. Gerard, said quite a bit that I agree with. Um, what I'm wondering is if uh, we become a blighted neighborhood, how much is our taxes going to go up? We've lived there four years. My taxes have gone up $2,400 a year for the year, those four years. That's a lot of money for four years living in one spot. I like where I live. I think it's a great area. I don't understand why anybody would think that should be a blighted area. Um, we had an addition done to our house before we bought it. So does that make our house newer than 40 years? What I'm saying today is it's an excellent neighborhood. I don't think the TIF money should be used to build a business down the street, adding eight, 10 jobs in the town when this whole town is starting to die. The railroad's laying off, I work for them. And I'll probably have a bolo on my back after this. I work for them and I'm seeing what's going on. We got houses in Dixie Lane or Dixie Court or whatever it is that haven't sold yet. New houses, much smaller than my house. They're selling for what, 250? That's a lot of money for a house that's much smaller than my house that's probably 39 years old. Um, what's gonna happen with People not moving into this town. How is this town going to sustain? How are we going to sustain that fancy new hospital we have? How is that going to happen? By blighting a decent neighborhood? By blighting a good neighborhood? By blighting a neighborhood that still has people there that are hardworking, some retired, lots of kids. That's why we moved there, lots of kids. We have four kids at home. And now you're telling me you're going to blight my neighborhood? I don't understand that. I don't know what you're going to vote, but I'm hoping you vote against it because it's not right. First of all, maybe us as a neighborhood should have been told that you were going to go through this, excuse me, this process instead of just going through the process and voting on it. And nobody knows about it until, of course, a couple weeks before this meeting starts. I don't understand that. There should have been something sent in the mail. There should have been something said. So where's the communication? For these families, for my family. What am I going to do if my taxes go up more because it's a blighted neighborhood? And, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense to me. You blight, taxes go up. I don't understand that. And I don't understand the fact that we're all sitting here and we're not getting new businesses in this town to support this town and the infrastructure of this town. The police department, the sheriff's department, the fire department, the hospital, the retirement homes, so on and so forth. What's going on? Where's the money? Where's the business? I want you guys to start listening to us, talking to us. We put you in office for a reason. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I feel passionately about this. This is just, I don't understand it. I don't know why we're doing it. I don't know why we weren't told about it. I don't know why we're not getting businesses in here. The railroad's dead, as far as I'm concerned, for this town. They're gonna keep a certain amount of people and then it's done. 
You need to bring something in for these new families, these new people. And the hospital isn't the, the only place that's going to sustain that. We need something else that will sustain this town. Make this town strong again. Make this town worth wanting to stay here. I love it here. We moved here from Denver. I did. I'm originally from Oregon. And I like this town. It's great for kids. It really is. I want to keep it that way. But I also want some future, too. I plan on retiring here. So I want some future for my children. I want them to stick around as long as they can to do something worthwhile instead of going somewhere else. So why don't we open the doors about that, stop blighting neighborhoods that really don't need to be blighted, and let's move on and let's bring in some worthwhile manufacturing jobs, jobs that pay so we can add to this infrastructure and make this town strong again. All right, I went on, off on my tangent. Sorry about that. You guys have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mark Woods, 902 North Emory. Um, I'll try to keep my comments brief. I can't really hear out there what everybody else has said, and I don't want to just go over the same ground, but um, I, I think a lot of the problem with this is just the arbitrarity of, of, of the law. Somebody decided 40 years a house is no longer, you know, it's blighted of standard, which is not true at all. Um, and and the undeveloped they call the land undeveloped when it's farmland, which you know, guy plants a crop on it every year. It's being used as a business, so I don't know. I don't know where that comes in. And there's so many others. I drove through the area today. You know, it's a nice looking place. There's a couple of construction trailers there. People are having work done. You know, I think Tip just um, well, I mean, never mind. I'm not going to say anything about that. We're not talking about that. <laughs> not tonight, anyway. Um, you know, but probably we're going to build houses, and we have a lot of houses. Um, I heard a rumor that that uh, DP has postponed their project for a while. I don't know why COVID-19, you know, they think it's just not going to, we don't need this. The buildings and they think they won't fill up. So I think it's, you know, it'll drive down property values if you have a glut. And I look at the sales all the time since I like to buy things, and uh, there's quite a few. So with taxes the way they are, I don't see where that will help us out any. I, I think I'll call that good. Probably everybody else probably covered everything else already. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Well, good evening again. Good evening. So, uh, most of you know me, uh, Keith Marvin with Marvin Planet Consultants. Um, been through some pretty contentious uh, discussion last week with the Planning Commission and hearing some things today. Uh, what I want to address is the process by which the study was done and why we did what we did and other things that happened. Uh, first of all, I was approached by Mr. Wilkinson wanting to look at a way to make this area potentially blighted and substandard. Well, as you look at this land, and this is not an unusual process that I've been through and seen in other communities, is we had to find a way to make it at least meet some of the rules that are provided to us in state statute. So what we found, and in no case uh, were any of these structures looked at and deemed to be blighted and substandard as far as condition is concerned, but statute does provide under the definition of blighted and substandard that if you've got a predominance of uh, structures that are 40 years of age or older, 
then they, that can be used in order to make the declaration. So there's been a lot of questions asked. Why not the area between Sugarberry and West Egg? Okay, when we look at 40 years of age, I look at it two different ways. The w standard way that we did it until about two or three years ago was we just looked at the number of years and said, good, we're good. Uh, the study does say that there's 24 total houses or structures. Uh, the one comment there is 25, but by adding that extra structure, we go from 75% being over 40 years of age to 76%. So we look at it that way. The attorney, uh, the auditor's office in Lincoln came out and audited a bunch of studies uh, a few years ago, and they wanted us to look at what the actual age average was per structure. Thus, we have the table in there, and we had an average age of there in there of 39.5. So when you round, you get to 40 years of age. So that's why we did that. Also, you look at the condition uh, on the streets and some of the curb and gutter in there, that also helped add to the factors that were involved. Now, as far as this having a lot of farmland, there, you know, I've heard this question, well, it's just farmland, we can't blight that or do, and use t those type of things. Well, first of all, the courts have said we can in Nebraska. Uh, there is one case out of uh, Hastings where they try to take raw land and tack it on to another area, and that was stricken down because they said if you have an area that's added to another area, it has to stand on its own merits. So we're not adding to anything. A similar case to this, had a few more buildings in it, was taken all the way to the state Supreme Court in City of Fall City as a study I authored, and that was upheld by the courts. So using raw ground like this is not unheard of in Nebraska. And a vast majority of what we do in the state with TIF is done on raw ground. So as we move forward, I guess some of the other things I've heard is this TIF eventually, we're not here to necessarily talk about TIF, but TIF does not hurt your budget because right now, if some, this project were to go and you were to eventually TIF this, the city maintains the base rate that's on that property right now. So what happens is over the course of 15 years, you see tax increases that go in to help pay off the indebtedness for whatever the infrastructure is, or a bond or however it's done. And at the end of that 15 year period, the city sees a huge increase in your tax base from this development. And most of the time, if it's done properly, the TIF is done as a loan or uh, uh, collateral to the uh, developer to take to the bank. So the developer is still on the hook for that money. All the city does is says, if he pays his taxes, we'll pay the TIF, we'll give you your TIF money to pay off on that loan. So you're just a pass through on the taxes to help pay off the loan in which he's probably done something with streets or infrastructure, which the city gets the benefit in the long run of brand new water and sewer and streets and such in that part of the city. So there's a number of positives. As far as the folks on Sugarberry, the more development you see out here of better quality homes, that's only going to assist you, assist them and their values of their land eventually going up as the valuation of that neighborhood goes up. So one last thing I wanna add, I started down a path and I took a uh, detour, is the area between West A and Sugarberry. I did look at that area. But when we have to look at this stuff from the standpoint of averaging out the ages, we've got several lots in there that the structures were built in 1979, but we also have a lot of them that were built in 1983 and 1984. That area didn't help balance out that average, so that's, not, that's why it was not included in this study. So, it was done as a strategic, and I mean, we've been honest, this was done as a strategic way to, in order to declare, get this area to meet the standards of the statutes under blighted and substandard. 
Any questions? Yeah, Keith, I have a question. Okay. In a nutshell, you're telling us that if you did not throw in sugar berry, it would not qualify. That's correct. So you can basically do a lot of gray areas to get something to become eligible, which I personally I don't care for. Well, I, what I am doing is I'm taking the statutes and using them to my client's advantage. Exactly. Okay, it's it's illegal, and it's a way to make it happen. So. Uh, you're not the only time I've ever done this, and other communities have done it, and it's gone through just fine. So it's a matter of trying to play that balance if you're going to see some development or help put some future development down the road. Other questions? Yeah. So why is 39 and a half good enough, and it doesn't have to be 40? Well, if you uh, anything that you do that's odd number that hits 0.5 or better, it rounds up automatically. Is that like in a court case or state law? That's just, that's just mathematics. So that's why I'm, I know people question the 45.4%. It's depending on how many digits I go out. So the closer I move it in, the better, the more, you know, so. You know, that could have been very well, I've been 39.5987, I don't know. But that's why I also include the uh, inventory in the table looking at this and saying, okay, there's 25 structures. In this case now, 19 out of 25 are over 40 years or 40 years of age or older. So the majority of those houses are 40 years of age. It's just amazing to me that we're spending all this time talking about this one road that has nothing to do with this project. And maybe the statutes need to be changed. Well, you know, I, I people have said they don't like the term blight and substandard. I don't either. I don't, I don't, I don't either. But the problem is it takes a change in the constitution in order to make that happen and go away. Because it's written into the constitution that way. The question I want to know here is that you know, please understand where we're at in our situation. Yeah. This is this is not a uh, it's controversial. And you know, and, and, and I understand the only criteria that we're meeting in that, that, that uh, is it A or B? Or you're meeting both and substandard. Otherwise, I wouldn't have brought it forward. Well, okay. That means the only thing you really have is the, the age. I mean, no. These aren't, these aren't substandard homes. It's the age. No. But if you but if you take a look at the streets and how cracked up they are and how they've been filled in the past, that's where I'm getting the uh, the condition of infrastructure and all of that. That's playing into the other items as well. So the streets, the curb and gutter, and some of the sidewalks. You're doing a good job. I'm not arguing no. with you. What I'm saying is, what only makes me uncomfortable about this is that the statute says 40 years. And we owe 39.5 and we're rounding up. If, if, if there were other criteria that this was meeting, I can go with that. Well, that 40 years seems to be like kind of a, a, a set deal. And if, not, if that's the only criteria, these are okay. substandard, we're not making it. I'm just telling you, it makes it very difficult for us in our situation to say this is substandard. Okay. And I guess the way, the way I should present this in here is. Okay, if you look at every age and you average it out by the 25 or 24 uh, structures, okay, it's the 39.5. But if you take a look at the table, the other one where we have 19 structures that were built in 1980 or earlier, which is 76% of those structures, that tells me right there we're leaning towards that 40 years very easily because you've got a you've got a big majority of those homes meeting that criteria that based upon what the assessor said they were built it just happens that we might have one that was built in 80 and one that was built in 82 that throws it off and you what I understand what you're saying here you have to throw in, in sugarberry to make this work and if you don't put in sugar berry, there's no other alternative. Is that what you're saying? Uh, it would be very, I, there's some other ways I could have done this. 
But no, no, you're fine. I mean, but, really, I mean, I think the people really are upset because it seems to be a, it is an arbitrary decision. And, and uh, uh, you know, I'm telling you with what we deal with out here with politics, mm -hmm. uh, I suggest we look at it a different way. I don't, I'm not buying it. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm just. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, okay, now would you be more comfortable under B instead of the, uh, let's see, make sure I'm in there, okay, under number five of B, now I'm allowed to use the, uh, the area has had either stable or decreasing population based upon the last two decennial censuses. If I took out Sugarberry, it's had no, no population. So it's maintained a stable population for the last two census. And that's in the same criteria as building age, structure age. I'm, I, I mean, but see how this can be worked. So why didn't you? I, I really thought that that would be more controversial than what I did, so honestly. So basically, you thought both of them were going to be controversial. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Marvin, I, I have a couple questions for you, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, I think you said that you saw some deteriorated streets and deteriorating streets. Is that correct? And curves? Yeah. And curves. Um, I, excuse me. Go ahead. I was going to say, I rate them, I believe, either average or, or slightly below average out there. Okay, so what is the definition of deteriorated or deteriorating? I mean, anytime you, anytime you deal with concrete, um, uh, it seems like uh, concrete's going to crack. And so what, what's the definition of deteriorating or deteriorated? Well, a lot of times when I start seeing a spider web of... Uh, tar and stuff put into uh, fill cracks, I start seeing that there's been kind of some sort of trend going on in that area that needs to be addressed. It may be either subgrade or some other thing that's making that concrete shift in different ways. Okay. And the same goes for the sidewalks or the curb and gutter. Once you get a chip in a curb and gutter, all that concrete is going to do is to keep falling apart down during our winters. Hey, the other question that I have, and I think it's been brought up, but um, there, there's no place in the statute that allows for rounding the numbers. And there's no, but I, I can play that argument back and say there's no place that says I can't either. This, <laughs> Uh, no, but uh, I understand Mr. your argument. I understand your argument, yeah. Mr. Martin. Well, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is that there's no place in the statute that that allows for rounding the numbers either up or down. Okay. Okay. Then um, I do have a question too. Um, I think you did say that there's 25 houses there. Can you help me understand what that is all about? As far as what? Well, I think you're primary have... structures. Primary structures. And what is a primary structure? A house or a duplex or something. It's not going to be an outbuilding or detached garage or anything like that. So when I look on Google Earth and look at your map that you have outlined the uh, the area that you, that you would like us to declare blighted uh, and substandard. Uh, on Google Earth, I find 25 uh, structures, as you call them, on on the area that you have outlined. Is that how you yes. count them? Yes. When you do your average, you use 24. Okay, let me... Give me a second.
Well, if I knew how to run a calculator, it'd be. That gives me an average of 39.52. Okay, so if you're using, I, I guess I'm confused. If, if we're gonna declare 24 units in that blighted and substandard area, then shouldn't we modify our map to, as you, I think, mentioned at the Planning Commission meeting, surgically remove that unit that is not included in the blighted area? Actually, what we need to do is just change the, uh, add the number and uh, fix the addition that's in there. It's a typo in the uh, actual report in the table. So, uh, as far as your question on rounding, there is nothing in the statutes that require me to even do the averaging that I did. That has come as a directive from the state auditor's office after they went through and audited a number of blight studies. There's question as to if that's what the legislature meant when they wrote these, or if it's the, the uh, 19 structures versus the six that I mentioned in the report. That's why I use both, is we've actually been told to do this, not by statute, but by the auditor's office. And I typically, in statute's quiet on which way they like it. So has any of that information allowed for rounding up or down? It has in other places that I've worked with and nobody else, has, no other councils have that issue with it. I'm talking about the auditor or the courts. They never have given us any direction beyond that in their report and it's never been tried. Okay. If you wouldn't mind, go back to the blighted definition there under letter A. As I read that, it says that any of these conditions substantially impairs or arrests the sound growth of the community. Can you explain to me how your determination of a deteriorated or deteriorating streets and gutters and curbs is substantially impairing or arresting the sound growth of the community? Well, there's a number of things that it could fall into, and that is one, if it's uh, not kept up in the long term, it could cost additional money to repair or replace that area. Uh, I mean, it could, I've been on roads that uh, have damaged my vehicle because of the way they were. So the idea is that hopefully some of the stuff would get uh, brought up to standards at some point in time. Well, it's my understanding that this tip pack, this, this blighted and substandard uh, definition is to evaluate the circumstances as they are today, not yeah. how they're going to be in five years or 10 years down the road. Is that correct? But if you're going to look at how it's going to impair the community, and it says, uh, let's see, a presence of a substantial number of deteriorated structures, uh, existence of defective or inadequate streets. Essentially, what you're doing is we're looking at this from a standpoint that it's on its way already to be blighted or, or to being deteriorated at this point in time. If something isn't taken at some point in time, it is going to become even worse. That's why we have a street department and they do a pretty good job. So um, I guess that's all my questions. I would, that, that's all my questions. Ty, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Marvin, just a couple of questions. Would you, would you mind sharing with us what your general history is in completing blight and substandard studies and how many you have had contested by the state auditor or court where they've been reversed for being deemed inappropriate? Okay. Uh, I've done a hand, I've done probably three or four here in the city of uh, North Platte. I've done two or three in the city of Hastings. I've done nearly 20 studies in the city of Grand Island, some of them also residential. I've done in David City, I've done them in Falls City, uh, all over the state. 
Uh, I've only had one contested, and that was in Fall City, and that was upheld by the state Supreme Court. I, I guess maybe this is just a point. I think my opinion we're getting misfocused on this issue. This is an opportunity for our, our community to designate an area for good things to happen, for development or redevelopment. The law is intended for CRAs to pass TIF bonds to provide assistance that come from the projects themselves. They don't come from a pot of money within the city, they come from the projects themselves through the creation of new taxes. And they're for projects that wouldn't be feasibly, that wouldn't be economically feasible otherwise. I mean, if people have uh, I respect an opinion against the use of TIF, and I respect an opinion against the TIF here, but to spend all night trying to discredit Mr. Marvin's um, study on a rounding technicality, I think isn't the point of this discussion, is misfocused in my opinion. I mean, it's it, everybody has a right to their opinion, but is that what this is really about? Um, is whether it's 39 and a half or, or 40? I guess maybe just a quick question for Mr. Mr. Wade, is the, the rounding air issue, Terry, do you see as a huge potential legal issue for the city? Or do you feel like Mr. Marvin's um, um, position on that is acceptable? I would feel it's acceptable. I don't think there's a prohibition one way or the other. I don't think it's going to be a fatal flaw is my reaction. I understand the policy issues from both sides, but that's not my role. I don't, and to directly answer your question, Ty, no, I don't see it as a fatal flaw. Just to clarify, because I couldn't hear that well, you said you don't see a huge issue with the rounding. Is that no, correct? I do not. And, and again, I guess my point is, is that I, I absolutely respect and appreciate everybody's opinion about, about whether the use of TIF is a good or, or a bad thing, but I, I, Mr. Marvin has a good reputation and, and I tend to think he knows more about this particular subject than, than I do for sure. Can I ask a question? Uh, the, you, you'd have to address the mayor, ma'am. I'm sorry. The mayor. Uh, have you drove down Sugarberry lately? I don't know who's talking. It's Peggy Jonas and I live at 4002 Sugarberry Road. And I would just want to ask you, have you driven down Sugarberry and hit any potholes lately? Are you or asking me? Well, I, I mean, you know what, if you want to ask a question, come up here, please. Mr. Mayor, if I may, while she's coming up, add one thing to what Ty started out with. The other thing about this is, in the state of Nebraska, cities have so few tools for economic development of any way, shape, or form. This is one of those key tools that you have in your toolbox. Even the program that they call Nebraska Advantage does not benefit communities very well because the state forgives sales tax on certain types of projects and then in turn comes back to the cities and starts pulling it out of your receipts to help pay the state back. So it may be a great project for employment and, and things for the state, but eventually it's going to hurt, that type of stuff even hurts your sales tax revenue. Where TIF, like Ty said, is driven off of a project, not off of a pot of money. So. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, if you'd be so kind as to state your name and your address, please. Thank you, Jonas, and I live at 4002 Sugarberry Road. And I was just wondering how many of the councilmen have driven down Sugarberry Road lately and have had any big cracks and potholes or seen, the, seen it falling apart? Has anybody driven down? Oh, I have. And it's a problem? No, no problem. I'll say there are a lot worse roads than our class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, that's what, that's my point, is I don't understand why we can go by a crack in the driveway or a crack in the sidewalk and think that we're blighted. 
I mean, blighted is a vicious word. And when people move into town, they don't like to go and look at the blighted areas. And I may want to sell my house. And I'm not excited about being in a blighted area. And I'm sure the <clears throat> maybe future mayor who, live, who lives right behind us is going to be butted right up against the blighted area. We have firemen. We have uh, the Thompson. He is the fire chief. He lives right on our street. Is that a kind of a black mark for north side of all of our <laughs> our mayor or our fire chief lives on a blighted area? I don't think they're excited about that. But anyway, I just wanted to speak my piece and wonder how many of you really had seen Sugarberry. It's a great street. I have, and you have a gorgeous home, and I know um, the Thompson Palace. I, I know that area. It's, it's just a very nice area. One and, would be glad to live in. Yeah, and so you didn't notice of any wear and tear on your car driving up or down the street. I have not. All right. We don't, I believe any of us have had a problem with that either. But, well, thanks for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. I couldn't see who was in there talking, so thank you for coming up. Uh, I understand there's someone online that wishes to speak, and can we make that happen? What was the name? Jim C. Jim, are you online? Oh yes, I'm here. Would you this be so kind as to your, oh, wait a minute? Could you give us your name and address, please? This is Jim Connor, C O N N E R, thirty eight eleven Sugarberry Road. Hey, I. Who stands to profit the most by this? The community, the developer, who? Simple question. Who stands to profit or benefit the most from this? Mr. Marvin, can you answer that? I can, I, was, I wasn't in. Who stands to benefit or profit the most? Benefit okay. and profit are two different things. Okay, in the long run, as far as benefit, I think all parties involved will benefit because one, the developer will have an economic development tool to help pave the street. Put What's the wrong road. with my street? Have you driven down it? Have you personally driven on this street? I, I was talking have about, you? I was Answer, here. simple question. Have you driven Connor, on this Mr. street? Connor, Mr. Connor? Yes. I appreciate that uh, you would wish to speak, but please tone it down just a tad. Well, it kind of aggravates me, Mayor. I understand that, but you can be kind enough to ask a question. I don't have a problem with that. But, so please well, he question. can answer the question, too. Okay. Who stands to benefit the most? Benefit and profit, I see as two different things. Okay. I don't, you're, you've got two different things, yes. But in the long run, the developer will make money off of this. Yes, he oh, will make money off of this. Okay. How will that benefit me as a homeowner? Okay. As these homes get built, and he- Who's going to buy these homes? My employer is going downhill rapidly. Mr. Connor? Yes. Would you be so kind as let this gentleman answer your question before you ask some more questions? All right. Thank you. Okay. What happens with this process is, First of all, I don't know who he's got in mind for home. That's, that's the free market at work, all right? But this, all this is doing is in the long term, it would allow him potentially to put in the paving, the water, and the sewer to the homes he builds. Now, what happens is, <coughs> excuse me, um, as he builds these homes, he's going to increase the value of the whole neighborhood. Ultimately, he makes your house worth more when you're ready to sell at some point in time. It brings up the value of the whole neighborhood. So does it get your street fixed? I don't know. It depends on how things are restructured with the TIP agreement. And that's beyond where we're going tonight if we get that far. So 
everybody benefits. The city benefits by having extension to their water and sewer provided by the developer and using the taxes generated off of his project to pay for that. So you've got the ability to grow the city and add new homes to the area on the west side of town. Now the neighborhood, everybody will benefit potentially by seeing the value of their home go up and appreciate. Well, I guess the only thing I've seen is, is a tax increase, not a value increase, it's a tax increase. If you could, if you could see the... That's, that's a question for your assessor. If you could see the graph I've prepared here, you know, it's the, the value has not increased proportionately with the taxes. And so, you know, I'm frustrated by this. If I wanted to sell my house and move out, I'm not sure I could. Where do I go? What's a simple suggestion, I guess. Uh, blighted and substandard, you know, it kind of puts a stigma to this that uh, I don't want. Okay, the, the thing that needs to be understood is that this is a very, very bad set of words that were chosen by our legislature a long time ago. And we are not able to change them because it takes a change to the constitution of state. So if it, I don't know that it'll make you feel any better, but the city of Omaha one time had a project and I'm sure it's gone away by now, but at one time, Mr. Buffett lived in a blighted and substandard neighborhood in Omaha. And he lives just east of UNO, which is a very, very nice neighborhood. So, I mean, this is a terminology that's used. Uh, I mean, if we could change it to development enhancement area, that would be wonderful, but we can't. I will tell you that it, it should not impact the value of your home. It should not impact, hopefully it won't impact your value. I don't, I can't ever guarantee on taxes because, you know, sir, my taxes keep going up too in the county I live in, so. Mr. Connor, thank you very much for your uh, questions. Very much appreciated, and I understand your frustration. Anybody else, anyone else? My name is Darren Wilkinson. I live at 1920 West Leota. I am the uh, potential developer of the project. And I just want everyone to know that I feel bad that we have to take a street in North Platte that is a really nice street with really nice homes and call them blighted and substandard because I wouldn't want that either. Um, but it should not, like just like he said, it should not affect the value of the property. It's just a term that is used by the state in order to qualify a project for TIF funds. And that's all it is. And the only reason that we included that street and those homes is because they're 40 years old. The only reason. It's a, it's a means to an end. And obviously, we're, I'm, I will be trying to get TIF financing on the project. Um, because it's not financially feasible without it. The last project that I've developed was in 2008 uh, over on Bush Court off of Bear, and there was a 12 lot cul-de-sac and my cost in the lots after the land and all of the development was approximately 12,000 per lot. Uh, on this particular project, um, I'm looking at purchasing the land between A and Sweetwood. Um, and it would, so it would be an 18 lot cul-de-sac kind of on the south end of Lakeview Boulevard. And uh, I'm estimating my costs at around 550,000 to develop the project. So we're looking at a, at a wholesale cost of around 30,000 a lot. And by the time uh, you know, if a developer wants to make any money on them, obviously you've got to sell them for more than what your cost is. So in order to make a, a decent profit, you'd be in that 35 to $38,000 a lot 
um, it was what you'd be trying to sell them for. Um, so it's, it's quite a difference in 12 years from the, you know, the project that I did on Bush Court at 12,000 a lot. And now the cost is, is over 30. And I can't answer. People have asked me, why does it cost so much to develop land? And I, I, I don't know the answer. But I do know that the city of North Platte has set a somewhat of a precedent, I think, in that there's some out of town developers that purchased some land on the north side of A, just uh, by Lakeview Boulevard. Actually, it's just catty corner from this property that we're trying to get done here. Uh, that project was just tipped recently. Uh, another out of town developer, chief development or chief construction, uh, bought the land out by on Halligan Drive, out by the Hampton Inn, another out of town developer, Round Iron Eagle, that project was tipped. Uh, Lonnie Parsons bought a piece of land at the corner of Phillip and Dixie. That's very close to this property. That project received TIF financing. Um, so I feel like a, a normal developer that wouldn't go after TIF would be at a disadvantage economically compared to these other developers that are getting TIF financing on pretty much the same stuff that we're talking about out here. This is land that's been in the city for 20, 25 years in the city limits. It's, I, I lived on, on Sugarberry Road or, or on Sequoia Court is where I used to live. My kids walked down Sugarberry Road to Eisenhower School when they were growing up. It's a great street and I feel horrible about having to call it blighted and substandard, but it's just the, it's, that's the only tool we have. It's what we have to do to, in order to promote development. And so that's, that's why I'm trying to, to get the whole area blighted and substandard that they do it in Omaha and Lincoln and Grand Island and Kearney and Hastings and everywhere else, all these other communities and, and here North Platte's trying to keep up with these communities, uh, building new houses, building, I mean, you know, you have to have new houses to have people move up. Um, that's a lot of the houses that I've been selling are move up buyers. They're people that have a house that's maybe 200,000 or $150,000 and they're going to move up to a 250 or $300,000 house. So it just opens up the market for some, uh, for the, the lower end workforce type housing. Um, I guess that's, that's all I have to say. If you guys have any questions for me. Mr. Wilson, a uh, question for you. One thing that I think is a potential misconception from people that have contacted me is a concern about you wanting to come in and do something on Sugarberry. And I guess, would are you aware of either you or other any other landowners that are in this track who have any plans of changing anything on Sugarberry? Or from your perspective, has Sugarberry only been included to help this track be eligible? Yeah, that's the only reason we pulled Sugarberry in is just because the houses were 40 years old and it helped us meet one of the state standards that we had to meet uh, in order to get it blighted and substandard. It's the only reason. I don't have any plans on doing anything on Sugarberry. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thanks, Jerry. What's that? I believe that we've heard enough. Are we, is there something that new they might talk about, or is it the same thing? I think we've heard plenty, but who, who wants to talk? It would be short, then. Come on in. Lisa, is that right? Yes. So, uh, thank you for giving me just another minute. You're welcome. Um, it's hard for me. Stand here and see that one person stands to profit from this. When I'm 47.9 years old, so we'll round it up to 48. Um, I'll be 48 next month. My husband is uh, 55 and a half, so we'll round him up to 56. We have worked our entire lives to live somewhere as nice as we do. We have seven children, seven, 
only four left at home that get to enjoy this beautiful home, this beautiful neighborhood, the wonderful neighbors that we live with. We're a community. We watch out for each other. Those sidewalks are the same sidewalks my kids are riding their scooters up and down, and they're not cracked enough for them to be even wearing helmets, I'll tell you that. But for us to work our entire lives to live there, and because one person stands to benefit financially, we may not be able to afford our home if taxes continue to rise, which they will, if that area is improved for one person, I will lose my home, I won't be able to sell it. I don't know, I mean, Mr. Wilkinson might just buy it on uh, auction because I won't be able to continue to pay my home. My husband and I both work, I own my own business, he works for the railroad, we have worked so hard to make enough money to provide a good home for our family. And to declare our home blighted and have us pay the price, have that burden put on our backs for his profit is just not fair. So I do thank you for letting me speak one more time. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Donna, sure, come on in. I won't forget who I am this time. <laughs> Donna Tryon, 820 South Bryan. I just wanted to say also that I don't know where Darren went, but I appreciate what he's trying to do. It's not his fault, I don't think at all. I think the community has used TIF and it has inflated maybe um, the cost of property here because of it. And the other thing I just wanted to note was that uh, we're in a COVID-19 and we don't know how much money is going to be coming into the city or how people are going to be paying their property tax. And I think that by itself would be, it would be nice if we could just postpone it, but maybe I know they have so many days and they got to move on. But anyway, I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. Mr. Mayor, can I make a motion to close the public hearing? Wait a second. Okay. Roll call. Nisley. Aye. Backenstos. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Lucas. Aye. Lee. Aye. Carmen. Aye. Reeker. Aye. Ostendorf. Aye. Motion carried eight to zero. Okay, public hearing's been closed. I would make a motion that we deny the resolution to approve and adopt the blights and coast plan study by the city of North Platte and approve of the related uh, actions regarding to North Platte, Nebraska blight, coast plan study blight, study area drifting prepared by Marvel Planning Consultants. Second. So that's really the point of order. Point of order. I think you would do the motion to adopt it. You can also do a motion to deny. Uh, you don't, you don't make, make a motion. Right. I think we have to make the positive motion. Yeah, positive motion. Andrew, I think there'll be clarification. Okay. There'll be less confusion. We'll withdraw and motion to approve the blind coordinator study by the city of North Platte, provided by Martin Planning Consultants. I'm sorry, I want to clarify. Is it a motion to approve? Motion to approve now. I'll and second. I, and I, who seconds? Aye. Okay, thank you, Ty. The motion on the floor is to approve. So if you choose not to do that, obviously you're going to need a no. Uh, roll call. It is, can we have a little discussion on this, Mayor? I thought we've already had a lot of discussion, but yes, please do. Okay. Ty, do you have something? Yeah, I guess I was hopeful the council would get to talk about this a little bit. Um, I just want to share a few thoughts on it. Um, you know, this issue came up of a similar nature when we were looking at the Dixie and Phillip area. And I understand with all due respect to everybody who spoke tonight, that to have somebody come to your neighborhood and put this label on it is disconcerting, especially if 
you don't uh, look at each one of these tip reviews like we, we all do as they come up. I completely understand that. I truly feel there's, there's no detriment to, to homes in a, Sugarberry is a, a fantastic neighborhood. And I know the folks, I mean, I live right at Dixie and Phillip, and I had my neighbors lined up to be upset with me about how I felt about designating that area. I wish they would have gone one block over and pulled my house into it because I really wouldn't care because I don't feel it causes any, any detriment. And I just want the council to think about that the community, the chamber, private businesses, the state of Nebraska's housing trust fund have put thousands of dollars into trying to get workforce housing established. It's been identified as one of the top reasons that we have trouble attracting new employers into this community. And, you know, we, we aren't looking at the TIF tonight, so we don't know exactly what these projects are going to look like. But any project that comes forth, our CRA has to scrub and make a determination on whether they feel like it's economically feasible without it or not. And as long as the city does an effective job of analyzing those projects, the cost is zero of, of approving a TIF for a project that would not happen otherwise, because all of the TIF payments are created from the taxes from those properties. So it has no detriment to the rest of us as taxpayers. And so I guess I just want to remind the council that, that we've heard continued arguments that housing stock has been one of our community's greatest impediments to growth. And I truly, truly believe that. And I also truly believe that there's no detriment to people that live in this area. And if somebody wants to put, call my house in my neighborhood blight and substandard, that's fine. Because what I see it is as designating, it, it designates a redevelopment area. And I agree with what Mr. Marvin said and others said earlier, it's unfortunate that that's the term that's been used. But I think what happened was the law was originally created with more specific thoughts of blight removal. And as he evolved into being the only economic development tool we, we really have for putting uh, infrastructure in. And so I guess before everyone makes their vote, I just want the council to consider how hard our communities work to try to restart an industry that was practically dead in this town, which was new housing starts. And there's been a lot of efforts by a lot of people. And so I, uh, I just hope that, that that gets adequately considered. Do I have any, any other further comments, but thank you. Mr. Mayor, uh, I, I would want to make one comment. Uh, I, I just want to thank Mr. Wilkinson for his many years of constructing very quality homes in our community and, and heretofore not asking for any subsidy from the, from the city. Uh, he has a very good reputation and there's no way that I want to try to impinge on that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just uh, to follow up on stage, here's my concern, Ty, and the rest of the city council is, we already have a residential TIF project going right now. And just with the naked eye, it sure doesn't look like it's going very well. And I'm concerned with the COVID-19, if it would get worse and the economy got worse, that he could end it eventually maybe go belly up, then what happens? And so now we want another project for more homes at 250 to 350. I just can't see, I'm concerned about Darren not being able to sell those homes. So I don't know why we couldn't just put this on hold. I, my understanding is they can come back at any time and reevaluate and, and, and submit this again in six months or a year. And maybe the economy is doing great at that point in time. So what's going on now, it scares me the fact that Lonnie's project out there in West Phillip is kind of stagnant and that concerns me for the future. Right, but I think thing, the thing we have to remember on that is the city's in no way invested on the, in these projects and the money comes from the tax increment of things once they're built. And so if a subdivision is slower to build out than what is thought or projected, it actually puts the properties on the tax roll faster once the lots are built because they have less time during the 15 years. And so for example, if a cul-de-sac is built and they think it's gonna sell out in three or four years and it takes 10, well, if you set that TIF up on the front end, it runs for 15 years and then it sunsets 
And so in essence, it, it all sits on the developer. There's no, there's no downside for the city and, and the TIFs, the TIF stays with the land track. And so even if they end up having to sell the lots later or, or, or change them or whatever they do, for, but it has to be per the terms of the development agreement, it, the, the, we're not out anything. I mean, from, from our standpoint, we have, you know, I, I hope developers are successful. I want them to be so they build more North Platte, but the city's not out anything if their projects aren't successful. Can I say something? I'm sorry, man. That's up to the I, mayor. I, uh, mayor, may I may I speak? Uh, this is Peggy Jonas. I don't know who's talking. Peggy Jonas. Peggy, if you would like to speak, you'll have to come in uh, up here, please. I, I understand that. It is. Certainly entitled to your opinion, sir. Good morning, Peggy. I want you to understand that public hearings have been closed. However, I would like to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Where would the tax money go? Would it go to the schools? To or where would it go? Other than just hold it and wait on a developer, would we be using that otherwise for the city? Our tax dollars stay the same. Yeah, so the schools keep their portion, the county keeps their portion, we keep our portion, everybody keeps their portion. So it would just, you just sit there for 15 years and hold the money for the developer? No, they, you don't they, use every the, year they get a certain amount, like, so let's say hey, they build a house and that value went, that property went up from $15,000 a lot, I'm just guessing, by the way, don't quote me, $15,000 a lot, they build a house on it and that's worth $350,000, that increased property tax value, then goes to that developer to pay for that infrastructure that he had to pay for up front to put in. So the street that he put in, so the sewer that he had to put in, all that stuff, that's where that money goes back to just to reimburse him for those, which is usually actually to a bank, not actually to him. Oh, okay. Well, I was just wondering, I thought it could be used, uh, the TIF money could be used for our schools and so forth. It's not like a pot of money or anything. It's their own tax dollars that they're getting back to pay for this project, to Good. be honest. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Craig. When it would go through the TIF process with the CRA, the school districts and the taxing authorities, um, I think are invited to comment and uh, have, as part of the application process, they have to chime in on uh, whether they're in favor of the projects or have any concerns. Anyone else? Okay, we'll I believe we have a motion on the floor to accept and second by Ty. And I believe we're ready for roll call. Nisley. Nay. Backenstos. Nay. Peterson. No. Lucas. Aye. Lee. Nay. Carmen. No. Reeker? Nay. Ostendorf? Nay. Motion fails one to seven. Thank you, Don. And for all those that were here speaking, thank you very much for your input. We really, truly appreciate it. Thank you. We'll move on to item number seven. Third reading and action on ordinance number 4035 to create paving district number 835 on Reed Avenue from Oak Street to Spruce Street and Spruce Street from Reed Avenue to Phillip Avenue in the city of North Platte, Lincoln County, Nebraska. Mayor Livingston, would you like me to read the ordinance? Yes, please. An ordinance for the creation of paving district number 835 on Reed Avenue from Oak Street to Spruce, Spruce Street also Spruce Street from Reed Avenue to Phillip Avenue in the city of North Platte, Lincoln County, Nebraska, and ordering the construction of street improvements therein. We do approve ordinance number 4035 on third and final read. Second. Roll call, please. Nisley. Aye. 
Backenstos? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Lucas? Aye. Lee? Aye. Carmen? Aye. Reeker? May. Austin Dorf? Aye. Motion carries seven to one. Thank you. Item number eight. Adopt a resolution for the Nebraska Land Days Parade to be held on August 8th of 2020. Would we adopt a resolution for Nebraska Land Days Parade to be held on August 8th of 2020? Second. Roll call. Nisley? Aye. Backenstos? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Lucas? Aye. Lee? Aye. Carmen? Aye. Reeker? Aye. Ostendorf? Aye. Motion carries eight to zero. Thank you. Item number nine approves one year renewal for the interlocal fuel agreement between Lincoln County and the City of North Platte for services providing fuel to the Lincoln County Roads Department and authorize the mayor to sign all documents for the city. <laughs> so we approve a one year renewal of the interlocal fuel agreement between Lincoln County and the City of North Platte for services providing fuel to the Lincoln County Roads Department authorize the mayor to sign all documents for the city. Second. That's the same as last year, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Second. Oh, sorry, roll call. Nisley? Aye. Backenstos? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Lucas? Aye. Lee? Aye. Carmen? Aye. Reeker? Aye. Ostendorf? Aye. Motion carries <coughs> 8 to 0. Thank you, Tony. Item number 10 is claims. Who do we pay the claims? Second. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Don. I would bless you for roll call. <laughs> Isley? Aye. Back in shows? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Lucas? Aye. Lee? Aye. Harmon? Aye. Reeker? Aye. Ostendorf? Aye. Motion carries 8 to 0. Thank you, Don. Motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, roll call, please. <laughs> 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 Back in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back and Stowe's I I Peterson I Lucas I B I Carmen I Reeker I Ostendor I um oh, sorry go ahead Don motion carries eight to zero thank you Don you're very kind. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. We all do.